All right, hello everyone, this is Anna here, and we're gonna continue talking about neurophysiology, and what we're gonna do here in part seven is really focus in on um, looking at the action potentials in a little bit more detail. All right, so let's start getting into talking about this plasma membrane and what these various gates are doing, okay? So let's do a little bit more detail work. Now remember, here with an action potential, we are dealing with voltage gates. If you are dealing with chemical gates, chemical gates ugh, do not start action potentials. Chemical gates start local potentials, okay? And then the local potential needs to be strong enough to reach threshold, and if it reaches threshold, it will open up voltage gates, and then the voltage gates will trigger the action potential, okay? So it's that whole graded potential thing that initiates depolarization, okay? So let's look at this um, little gate. Let me actually see. Okay. So let's, lo let's look at this little gate right here, okay? So this is showing you a voltage gate. So I've got the plasma membrane right here, and this is the sodium side of the gate, and this is the potassium side of the gate. Now, at the moment, this is at the resting state, so you've got resting membrane potential. And what you're gonna notice is that this gate is closed, that one's open, this one is closed, okay? What is happening is neither sodium nor potassium can get through, okay? It's basically blocking those. But if I depolarize this little section, all right, it will trigger this gate to open, and then the sodium is gonna go through. All right, so I think the next side, we're gonna review the sodium potassium solute pump real quick, and then we'll go on to more pictures. The next slide real quick. Now, all right, so there are more than one solute pumps in the body, but this is probably one of the most important ones for maintaining homeostasis within the cell, not just for polarity, but also for osmotic pressure, okay? Um, so I want you to remember that there are those passive leak gates, okay? And they are more permeable to potassium and less permeable to sodium, but at all times, you've got these things flowing in and out. So you're gonna use this solute pump to fix the ratios. So their job is to maintain the ratio. And it basically is gonna keep 20 times higher internal concentration of potassium, okay? This is the key point here. Yeah, it triggers sodium, but see, I'm only gonna give it one little circle, whereas I'm gonna give lots and lots of circles to potassium. Potassium is the most important thing that it's moving around, okay? And it uses a lot of energy. So notice it's using a third of all the ATP energy in that eukaryotic cell, okay? So for vital functions, You've got maintaining the resting membrane potential, which is what we talk about most of the time. But when you get into pathophys, this part of that solute, become, solute pump becomes really, really important. It maintains an osmotic pressure in order to draw water out of the cell, all right? If you don't do that, then you get an exploding cell. So you may remember um, back when uh, you were doing basic bio, you looked at osmosis, and you looked at what happened when you put a cell in a hypertonic solution versus a oh hypo hyper hypertonic versus hypotonic solutions okay and so that becomes really important to maintain and then you've got the piggyback effect all right the solute pump has secondary transport mechanisms built into it where things basically piggyback all right, to get out or into the cell, all right? Let's look at a drawing. All right, I particularly like this drawing that I found in the book, because often they just show you the solute pump and then they like try to imply what it's doing without showing you all the steps. Oh, it's so annoying. 
this is what I want. It's still too small. Okay. Um, so if we're looking here, we've got, what do I want? I want this. We've got the solute pump right here. All right. You've got the plasma membrane here. All right. Cytosol. All right. Interstitial fluid. So this is inside and this is outside. Okay. So with this particular transmembrane protein, what you're going to do is use ATP energy to transport the sodium and the potassium. So if we move over to this little picture, now they're showing you the step where you hydrolyze, so you're gonna hydrolyze that ATP energy and that firecracker of energy is going to alter the shape of the transmembrane protein transporting these three sodiums in but while you're doing that you're basically opening up seats that sodium can sit in okay and the sodium are the right size and shape to fit in there whereas excuse me potassium is the right size and shape to fit into there whereas sodium is the right size and shape to fit into there Okay, now pay attention, you've still left an ATP, excuse me, let me erase that so you can see. All right, notice what you've done with your ADP and P molecule. Okay, so now you're going to come over here. Okay, once you hydrolyze that energy, all right, and it changes shape. The shape change then causes the phosphate molecule to pop off. That is going to trigger this to change shape again so that this part closes, so it goes in and it closes, and then that ejects the potassium out, okay? And that's basically, it's a pretty classic little example of um, active transport. All right, let's look at the next picture. Slide before this? Nope. Okay. All right. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but it is essentially my notes about what I'm going to talk about next. Okay. So, um, wait, is there? So, in previous slides, we've talked about what happens with depolarization. And now we're going to start layering on what happens with repolarization. But let's go ahead and um, look at the next um, set of pictures. All right, so we're looking here, and we're going to put negative 70 at resting membrane potential. And if you remember that with the muscle cell, we use negative 90, but we're dealing with a neuron here, so we're going to use negative 70. And then negative 55 is going to be where threshold is located, okay? So what's going to happen is you're going to be at resting membrane potential and there's going to be a stimulus. And that stimulus is going to open chemical gates with a neurotransmitter. And that's going to allow sodium to enter and to begin making the membrane less negative. Now, if it only gets to here and it peaks, then it's basically going to go back down and you will only have a local potential. It'll never become a, a resting, it'll never become an action potential. But if the gates stay open long enough that enough sodium comes in to get to negative 55, it will open voltage gates. All right. And with the voltage gates, we have the sodium gate with a fast door and a slow door. And then right next to the sodium protein, okay, so this is the, the proteins, those transmembrane proteins, right next to that is the potassium one, and it's just slow, okay? So right here, the fast sodium gate is going to open. The slow sodium gate was already open, okay? And that is going to allow more sodium to enter the cell, causing it to really become a lot less negative, and it's going to peak right there. But at this point, look what's happening right there. 
my fast gate is closed, all right? And finally, the sodium gate, excuse me, the potassium gate opens. So all of these start to move at the same time, but they move at different speeds. So here, the fast gate moves, okay? But then right here is where everything catches up and the slow gate for sodium closes and the potassium gate opens, okay? Now, when that potassium gate opens, positive ions leave the cell, which is gonna start making it more negative again. All right, and it's just gonna keep going and keep going. So we call this process repolarization. It's gonna come down here. Now, this gate right here, it is slow to open and it is slow to close. So it doesn't close when it really needs to. It gets gonna stay open a little too long and too much potassium leaves. This is going to hyperpolarize the membrane a little bit, okay? Hyperpolarize. This little dip right here, we also call the undershoot, okay? But then in combination between the passive gates and the sodium potassium ion pump, you're going to get it right back up to negative 70 and then you will be at resting membrane potential again. Okay, all right, next slide. All right, so with muscle physiology, we talked about refractory periods. We talked about two kinds. You have absolute and, I guess it cut off at the bottom, relative, okay? Absolute gates are doing their things. You can't make them do them any faster. So you cannot generate another action potential until those gates reset, okay? Relative is due to the undershoot, okay? when it becomes hyperpolarized. It becomes difficult to stimulate and start another action potential, but it's technically possible. Now, if we look at this slide, we're doing the same thing. We've got resting membrane right here. Chemical gates open, sodium comes in, it drifts up here, it reaches threshold, voltage gates open, sodium gate, all of the gates start opening at the same time, but this fast sodium gate opens up quickly allowing lots of sodium to enter. Right about here, that potassium gate finally gets open and the slow sodium gate actually closes. So sodium stops com coming in and potassium begins to leave, repolarizing the membrane right back down to here. Now this area uh, here is uh, controlled by those three doors and you cannot make them open or close any faster than what they're going to do. So you cannot start another action potential from here to here because you're dependent upon those doors doing their own thing. Now you get down to here, the sodium gate is still a little open and it's still allowing too much potassium to leave. But the sodium gates are reset. So technically speaking, if you get enough stimulus, you can generate another action potential right here. So it is considered the relative refractory period, whereas this section is considered the absolute refractory period. All right. All right, what I like about this picture is they have the graph over here, and then they've got your voltage gates over here. And you can take this number and match it up with this section over here, sort of. All right, so if we're looking at the graph, we're at resting membrane potential right there. What you see as the gates are closed. So this is my inactivation gate. This particular picture I like um, for many reasons, but I like the way they show this little ball and chain that kind of sticks out. 
And then they've got these two little lever arms. Now this one's for sodium. You can see the sodium's lined up, but it can't get through. And then over here, this one's for, for potassium, and it also has little lever arms. So you're basically right down here with us. Okay, let's look at the next slide now. All right, so what's gonna happen here? So now we're looking at this part of the graph. So that is corresponding to this part over here. So you have depolarized the membrane. That voltage change triggers this lever and this lever to go up and open this cavity. Now, you can't tell, but these are also moving. They're just really slow. This is the rabbit or hare, and this is the tortoise. They will both get to the finish line, but one is slower. And they both start at the same time, but one is slower. Now, pay attention to this inactivation gate because it's going to be important. Okay? Next slide is right here. Now we're seeing the inactivation gate. It plugs it. So I want you to think of a tub drain. The water begins to go down and that will pull the tub drain in and that will plug the tub. Now sodium cannot go in, but by the time this inactivation gate shuts, notice what the potassium gates have done. So this slow gate and this slow gate are about the same speed. And this corresponds right here, right here. Now this is gonna let lots of potassium out and it stops inflow of sodium, which means it's gonna start bringing down the resting membrane potential. All right. Now, you are back to this stage right here. The sodium gate, fast sodium gate has reset. The inactivation gate got popped out when these came down. But look at what's happening with this potassium gate. This pops out as soon as these go back into place. This is gonna just take a little bit longer to close. So it opens and it closes slow. So too much potassium leaves and that causes the hyperpolarization of the resting membrane potential, the area that we also call the undershoot. Okay. Now you're going to get it from here to here using those passive channels where sodium and potassium follow their um, concentration gradients. And you're also going to use the sodium potassium solute pump to help equalize that as well. Okay? All right. And then I have this really messy slide right here with a bunch of boxes in the way. But I think you probably recognize it. I bet you recognize it from when we did the muscular system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to input a blank whiteboard page and we're going to draw this out together. And you can always look at the picture here. What I recommend is that you draw out the steps yourself and you explain them to yourself. Look on the note slides. I've got little boxes that go with each one of the things. All right, so we can use the same basic picture to do neuron to sarcolemma or neuron to neuron. So notice what I've done here. I've labeled this the axon presynaptic, so before the synapse. And I've labeled this dendrite postsynaptic. And this again is going to be the plasma membrane of the postsynaptic dendrite. Okay, so we're going to bring this up here. We're going to have an action potential that's running down the plasma membrane of that axon. And that's going to come over here and it's going to hit a gate. This happens to be a voltage gate for calcium. Okay. The action potential opens up this gate 
and then that can send my little calcium molecules into the axonal terminal. Now in here, I've got vesicles with a neurotransmitter in it. It could be acetylcholine, or it could be epinephrine, or it could be dopamine, or serotonin, or GABA, or something else, okay? That's gonna cause this to come over here and merge with that plasma membrane, and via exocytosis, it's going to send the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Then there will be chemical gates that only open for that neurotransmitter, okay? The neurotransmitter will open this gate and then sodium ions will go into that area. This is going to take my resting membrane potential and begin altering it, okay, by bringing in more sodium ions. So and then we're gonna put negative 55 here. All right, so now we're here, the stimulus is right there. It's opening up the sodium fast gate. At the same time, the sodium slow gate is starting to move to shut and the potassium slow gate is starting to move to open. Okay, but this one's fast, so it's first. And that's gonna open and it's gonna allow these sodium ions to start coming in, changing the resting membrane potential. If it gets to threshold, it will open voltage gates, okay? And generate an action potential. So basically enough sodium needs to come into here that it can change the polarity over here of my sodium potassium voltage gate complex, okay? And I will have another one over here Okay, so everything in this area is a local potential. I will not get an action potential unless I can get enough of these to change the polarity here to trigger the opening of these voltage gates. If that happens, I get lots of sodium flooding into this area and that will begin triggering voltage gates all along the plasma membrane of the cell. And remember, this is an all or nothing thing. Now, if we're looking at the picture, and we've got our pl uh, plasma membrane here, and I've got my, let's see, let's erase this. As if you can't tell that I'm erasing it. Let's say I've got my cute little sodium gate here, okay? And it's got little levers, okay? And it's got its little ball and chain and active gate, okay? And then right here, I've got my potassium gate, okay? So when I change the voltage here, that's gonna trigger those to open, and then this space will be wide enough for sodium molecules to come in, okay? Now, as you're doing this, remember that this gate is starting to open. It's just really, really slow. By the time this pops into there to shut it down, so the inactivation gate shuts it down, this has opened, and now so potassium begins to leave and that's gonna start the repolarization process down to here. Now remember, it goes on for a little too long, and then it comes back up and goes to rest because this is a slow gate and it will stay open a little too long, okay? And then that brings you back 
to the resting state as everything resets. All right. Now, if you um, as you're going along. All right. And then the last little note slide that goes with this is just a reminder of what an action potential is. So this idea of all or nothing, you must reach threshold in order to propagate it. All right, if the initial stimulus is weak, you may need to wait longer or forever to trigger depolarization of a voltage gate because you've got to get enough sodium in there to swamp out the potassium in order to get to a voltage gate in order to trigger an action potential, okay? If the stimulus is too weak, you may never get an action potential, okay? But if it starts, it's all or nothing, and it's gonna move away from its point of origin, and it's gonna continue at a constant velocity as it goes along, okay? All right, that's the end of part seven, and I'm gonna stop this recording.